Well, hello and welcome uh, to this Breast Cancer Trials webcast. My name is Julie McCrossan and I'm truly delighted you're, you were able to join us tonight for the latest Breast Cancer Trials uh, Q&A. Breast Cancer Trials is the largest independent oncology research group in Australia and New Zealand, and they've been conducting clinical trials research into the treatment and prevention of breast cancer since 1978, which is a very famous date in the uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex plus world uh, of Australia and New Zealand, the first Mardi Gras date. Tonight, we're going to be exploring everything in relation to breast cancer in the LGBTQI plus community, including the findings of the Out With Cancer study from Western Sydney University. First of all, I'd like to pay our respects to and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia and New Zealand, where our audience is watching us tonight, and to pay our respects especially to Elders past, present and emerging. Well, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome the panel who's going to be answering all our questions this evening. Welcome to Professor Jane Usher. I don't know if you want to wave there, Jane. Uh, welcome to Jane Usher, Professor of Women's Health Psychology with the Translational Health Research Institute at Western Sydney University. And Jane was the lead investigator on the Out With Cancer study, which examined the experience of LGBTQI plus people uh, with breast cancer. I do sometimes use the expression rainbow people uh, uh, because there are a lot of letters, but we want to be totally inclusive this evening. I'd like to also welcome Michelle and Sharon Stevenson. We can wave to you. Uh, Michelle was diagnosed with breast cancer in March 2020, just as the world was going into COVID lockdown, which had you know, a special impact on both Michelle and Sharon. Welcome also to Dr Elizabeth Blackley. I've reached an age where our doctors look young, lovely to see you. And Elizabeth is a medical oncologist at Victorian Breast and Oncology Care. And Dr Blackley is currently the holder of a clinical fellowship uh, with breast cancer trials, and she'll be answering our medical questions this evening. Welcome to Jude Rafferty. Uh, Jude's partner, hi Jude. Jude's partner, Beck, was diagnosed with breast cancer in the 1990s and the cancer metastasized in 2001. And I'm sorry to say uh, that Beck passed away in 2016. Uh, so Jude is joining us tonight, uh, I guess, representing widows uh, and partners. Welcome to Kim Hobbs, who amazingly is joining us despite having COVID. And we're so grateful, Kim. Kim is a very experienced social worker with a long career in oncology social work and a master's degree. She's currently at Westmead Hospital in Western Sydney, and she has a particular interest in sexuality and intimacy in the context of cancer. And we, we welcome your expertise and uh, extensive experience with patients and family. And finally, welcome to Mrs. Catherine Wheeler, who was diagnosed with cancer in 2019 in a rural community in Queensland. And uh, a very pertinent flag we see behind you, which is the rainbow flag, but also the additional colours uh, associated particularly with transgender, uh, gender diverse people. So thank you for that. So a big welcome to everyone, particularly to all our viewers, especially if it's your first time joining us. Uh, we have people joining us this evening who have experienced breast cancer themselves, as well as family and friends. Well, look, let's kick off. If I could welcome again, Elizabeth Blackley, our medical oncologist. Oh, I have a number of questions for you from our audience, but just to begin, is it simply the case that anybody can get breast cancer, the full range of letters, genders and diversities? Welcome. Thanks, Julie, and thank you for complimenting the fact that I look young. Uh, the day people stop saying that to me is going to be a very sad day indeed. Um, look, absolutely, everyone can get breast cancer, and obviously the risk is higher in women, with one in seven women having a lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, and certainly in, in men, that risk is much lower. It's in 600 lifetime risk. Um, but look, most breast cancer is related to two things that none of us can actually sort of change. The most common reason to get breast cancer is because we're getting older. And the second is because 
we're women and that includes all women um, because it's related to our hormonal profile. So yes, anyone can get breast cancer, but the risk is mainly dictated by age um, and gender and things we actually can't modify. And I should say that uh, to our audience, we will be talking uh, directly about issues for transgender people uh, later this evening and coming to uh, our medical oncologist on that. But if I could just speak from my own life experience through my church group that I attend, the Uniting Church, which is very inclusive, I've known three people who have transitioned uh, from female to male, and I'm actually not aware about whether they have breasts or not. Uh, and so, you know, there is complexity isn't there, uh, Doctor? And we'll be dealing with that a little bit more as we go along. But let me ask, uh, we have a question from Faye, who asks whether breast cancer risk differs in the LGBTQI plus community. Is there a different level of risk? And Claire has also asked if there is an increased risk of breast cancer after hormone therapy. So could you go to those questions, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the short answer is sometimes there can be risk factor differences. I mean, really the main risk factors, as I said, are, are non-modifiable risk factors. And the biggest one is age. Um, definitely we know in the LGBTQI plus community there are higher rates of smoking and higher rates at a population level of, of alcohol. We also know that um, there are lower rates of pregnancy below the age of 30 in the community. And we know that that can statistically be protective for breast cancer risk. So different, um, still a risk that is lesser than the risk of women getting older, but yes, they are slightly different. The biggest risk I think that differs is probably the uptake in screening programs. Um, and that's really been something that's been poorly addressed in, in the LGBTQTI plus community. And it's something that um, we'll address a little bit later in more detail, but we do tend to see later cancers because um, women in the community aren't having screening as regularly or as proactively. The other question was specifically about hormonal therapy. And I think it's a really good one. And actually it's something that I've encountered only a few times and I had to think about a little bit. Um, and yes, hormonal therapy does increase your risk of breast cancer, but in a very similar way that hormonal therapy can actually increase your risk in a postmenopausal women as well. So it depends a little bit how long you've been on hormonal therapy. It depends um, on other factors and other risk factors, family history, um, but certainly trans women on hormonal therapy have a higher risk than baseline men. And um, depending on all of these, screening is really important, um, particularly after that five years of hormonal therapy. I'll just let you know, there is some, some uh, slight loss of sound with you, but uh, a sort of a, a delay, but uh, we might uh, deal with that a little later. I just want to ask you one more question before I go to someone else. That question, I want to be um, comprehensible to people for whom this whole issue of the LGBTQI plus world is very new. So that question relating to hormone therapy, just correct me if I'm wrong, is particularly uh, to uh, um, someone born as a man who may be transitioning to a woman and taking hormones to assist in that transition. Uh, that's what we're meaning by that question. Is that correct? Well, I'm sorry there. I'm afraid uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Blackley, our medical oncologist, has frozen. Uh, this is Julie, if you've just joined us, and we're looking at issues for breast, about breast cancer, particularly for people in the LGBTQI plus community. And I might uh, leave Elizabeth now, and we might see if she can reboot herself in some way, either as a person or as a computer, and, and she'll join us again later. Let me take this opportunity, if I may, uh, to welcome Catherine Wheeler again. Catherine, if you could wave, it's lovely to see you. And uh, just a reminder that Catherine was diagnosed in 2019. I think you're from a, a small uh, community in Queensland uh, and your wife is Linda and you've been in a long-term relationship and uh, uh, married uh, five years ago. Just tell us a, a little bit about your actual diagnosis and initial experience uh, with breast cancer. Welcome tonight. Oh, thanks, Julie. And yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I think, um, uh, yes, I was diagnosed in November 2019. So, you know, followed that fairly standard treatment path. Um, 
surgery than radiotherapy. And I'm currently on um, aromatase inhibitors. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there was nothing unusual about that. Um, probably the, the two biggest shocks uh, to me was um, that I had breast cancer. Um, I had no symptoms. Um, it was just discovered through uh, the regular breast screen um, uh, every two years. Um, and I think the other shock, well, it was more of a concern was, yeah, uh, being um, uh, a lesbian couple, how how the um, treating teams would would um, react or respond to um, when I introduced my wife, um, uh, you know, to the um, when we went for our appointments. So um, uh, I think we were fairly lucky that. Um, Oh, you know, I use the word luck. I probably would prefer to use the term favourable circumstances because I'm not a big believer in luck. Um, uh, but um, I think uh, right from the start with all of our appointments, um, uh, I introduced um, uh, my wife. Um, and I think um, apart from uh, a couple of deer in the headlights responses um, initially um, that uh, Linda was um, was reasonably well included in, in the conversations. I think too, um, Linda made sure that she included herself in the conversation. So there was really no ambiguity at all about who this person was sitting beside me. Um, so, uh, I think that did help a lot um, initially, um, sort of uh, helping us not be so concerned um, because really you go to an, a new appointment the first time and you essentially you're coming out every time. So, um, and for some people that can be a, a very difficult thing to do. So, so all those initial appointments um, for new people, um, yeah, we did find it a little bit uh, concerning as to how we'd be treated. Can um, I just say, uh, as someone who's had cancer herself with a multidisciplinary team, there are so many people that you meet, yes. aren't there? Yes. You know, it's a very large number of people. And I understand you knew many people in your town, but there were new people and that the vulnerability one feels with the shock of a diagnosis perhaps made you a little more sensitive to newer people than normal. Is that a, a fair Yes, problem? yes, that, that's that's exactly right. Um, um, it just added to that layer of worry uh, that you have uh, anyway um, as to how you'd be treated. And, yes, I, I guess I was in a fortunate position where... Um, you know, the radiographer who did my mammogram on my initial um, uh, appointments, um, you know, she she, she was a, had been a family friend for quite a long time. And, um, uh, you know, there were a few other um, people who uh, we were dealing with who, who knew my family. Um, so, and because, um, you know, we have been out for for quite a long time, um, you know, that side of things wasn't a problem for us, but uh, I'm not, and you know, I'm not assuming that it wouldn't be a problem for anyone else. I really think that fear um, and that whole having to come out again and again and again um, does add to the stress of the situation, and it did for us. I'll, I'll introduce another of our guests shortly, but I, I, when I spoke to you before today, you said how grateful you were uh, to uh, uh, the Breast Cancer Trials Group for raising awareness of this issue and also Breast Cancer Network Australia. And explain why you feel that sense of gratitude. Oh, um, oh I can't remember what I said to you yesterday, Julie, but um, I think um, just that acknowledgement uh, that, um, you know, people like us do have that 
layer of complexity um, and to be included, um, to have the materials that, that we can access um, that, uh, you know, gives us that reassurance that, um, that you know, we aren't isolated. Um, and that I think that that was also important as we moved along um, that, yeah, we, we knew that uh, we were being supported um, and not just by personal friends, but by that wider medical uh, community, if that makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. And Catherine, we'll, we might talk a little bit more about resources and the Breast Cancer Network is Australia Resources later, but look, thank you so much. Uh, let me welcome now Judith Rafferty, uh, whose partner, Beck, you'll remember, was diagnosed in the 1990s. And uh, a big welcome to you, Judith. I know that uh, before Beck sadly died in 2016, you had, uh, you know, a very long period of treatment, didn't you? Uh, uh, just give us a, a snapshot of that uh, cancer journey that you went on with your partner. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much, um, Julie. Yeah, it was a, a pretty big roller coaster for the period of time. Um, Beck was 38 uh, when she was diagnosed in 95 in her left breast, um, 90, and she had a mastectomy and a, a reconstruction at that time, followed by um, 96, it was diagnosed in her other breast, and um, she had radiation therapy. Uh, 2001, she had um, uh, um, metastasized to a sternum. 2010, it went to her uh, around her lung, and then in 2016, she uh, she died. So, it, so it was an, in amongst all of that. Just as an overview, we actually started off in Sydney, and we moved then into rural New South Wales then to Tasmania, then to um, back to Canberra, and then the last part of our, our journey was down on the south coast of New South Wales. So we had many, many, many um, uh, teams looking after us, and um, it was extremely difficult. It was like a roller coaster, and, and we went through many of the normal things that everyone with a cancer diagnosis goes through, which is fear and anger and sadness and frustration and and, but having to go in, I think because we, I think both of us had been had discrimination in the past as a lesbian, and for that reason, I think sometimes that um, probably preempted the thought that we may be treated differently. However, I, think that, I, if I, I could come in, June. I think that's a very important point for people tonight. That often that feeling of anxiety is based on even yeah. experiences that may go back to family times, you know, yeah. in the very early time, whereas t today uh, yourself and Catherine, myself, we're quite mature yeah. lesbian women, secure in our identity, but when you're in that more fragile history, it mm. can be different. Can I just say, tonight we're dealing uh, with, are there some special characteristics for this, for members of our community? And I think back in the 1990s, there was one of the struggles you had was there was less acknowledgement that lesbians were about. Yes, to <laughs> it, certainly, it certainly was. Um, I think we were just... I don't think we existed. I mean, people got breast cancer, of course, but there was no acknowledgement that you, if there was any difference with it, if you were a lesbian. And I suppose that that was quite different at that time. And the, there was, I mean, I think over the years, what's happened is that, you know, treatments have changed, um, um, attitudes have changed, um, but more importantly, so many of the resources have changed. When when we were diagnosed, you know, the Cancer Council had a booklet and there was a few resources, I'm, I don't deny that, but there was literally not a lot and there was certainly nothing about you know, lesbian women with breast cancer. The other thing is that there was not, for me as a, a partner, there was no support groups or anything. And that certainly changed over the years because um, we, um, when we went to Tassie um, on the, 20, the early early 2000s, we, we were looking for, for information after Beck had metastasized. And so we thought, well, there's none. And so we got involved with the um, National Breast Cancer 
Cancer Foundation and got involved in some research. Um, and we were a part of some of the research that went on. And then we got involved with the National Breast Cancer Network and they were putting out booklets and pamphlets and things like that and asked for our input as a lesbian into it. Um, and so we felt we felt that that was we were we became then a part of of, of the I don't know getting getting things better for for other lesbians. But because so, I think your partner Beck uh, be, um, did a lot of public speaking. She yeah, yeah. introduced you as her wife. Well, her partner. Partner. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so but another topic I'd love to bring up is this question of not making assumptions. I, I understand Beck was a very well groomed woman, very well dressed and that, that you wanted to mention it's so important for teams not to make assumptions because your partner was keen to have a reconstruction straight away when she yeah. had a mastectomy. Yeah. Uh, she was. She was. The assumptions yeah. that you're saying, please don't make it about lesbians, they may not be true. Yeah, she she was. She was um, meticulous in the way she dressed um, and loved every hair was always put in place every day. And, and, and her body image was something extraordinarily precious to her. And to have to have a mastectomy and then tram and lumpectomy and radiation, et cetera, et cetera. And then getting all the side effects, which other people get as well, of course. But she was, it was was very difficult for her but we were very lucky by the time um McGrath nurses were introduced in 2005 we when we came back to Canberra we had a metastatic um McGrath nurse um and look after us and we were able to talk about intimacy and body image and it was just they were just magic it was just wonderful because all those things had just been negated we just didn't have it to talk, we didn't have anyone to talk to. So, and our support group happened to be um, um, Dragons of Breast group that we helped set up in um, Tasmania. It was fabulous. We, uh, that that was that 20 women on a boat, um, two others were, were lesbians, but um, that was our support group, not uh, a, a group of men often over the age of 60, nothing wrong with that, but they didn't want to hear about two lesbians and their breast cancer at a support group. It just didn't didn't work. It's <laughs> one last thing before I, I bring in another guest. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, Beck died before marriage equality yep. uh, came in, uh, which mm -hmm. came in in December 2017. The capacity yeah. for same-sex couples to marry, and you feel uh, that you haven't had the status of a widow. That marriage has brought a certain level of acceptance, oh, but it absolutely. doesn't have the same. Uh, sort of power to say my partner's died of cancer is yeah. because it was really you feel it would be different if you were recognized as a widow can yeah. you just explain that yeah um when when um you Beck always as I said always introduced me as her partner what happened was when Beck died you um there's so, there were so many things that you had to fill out and and do but there was there's credibility in in being married um, or being being recognised as same sex couple. And what happened was when after Beck died and that that um, legislation changed for same sex couples, all of a sudden when I said my partner um, died of metastatic breast cancer, I no longer get those googly eyes that other people give you when you, oh my God, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's there's a legitis, legitimacy in, in being a lesbian whose partner's died. So uh, and because of that legislation, and I wish Beck had seen um, that time in by 2017, but wasn't to be. Well, thank you so much, Judith. It's really marvellous um, the way you're, uh, you and Catherine are sharing uh, you know, parts of your personal life to help people understand. I, I really thank you for it. Uh, if I could come uh, to Dr Elizabeth Blackley, our medical oncologist, who's been uh, listening to all of this. Um, uh, excuse me, I've just managed to get the incorrect page, which is never a tremendously uh, good idea. So forgive me, I'm going to go to someone else, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Michelle and Sharon Stevenson, if I may. And uh, Michelle was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer in March 2020. If you could wave, Michelle. So hello, hello to you both. It's and welcome and thank you for being in the same little square. Um, again, if you could just give us a, a, a sense of what you've been listening to, what you is similar to yourself and what is different. Do you want to just kick off? Thank you. 
If you could just turn on your microphone, please. And uh, Michelle is just there. We've got it on there. Sorry, Julie. Uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful to be here. I think it's really important that we all talk about breast cancer, no matter who we are, but particularly in cases with, for instance, with Jude, for instance, and Jude, I feel for you and that you were never allowed to marry before Beck died. And that's something that Sharon and I have been able to do, which is a real, we're very grateful to Australia for saying yes. Um, we were married in 2019 and soon after in 2020, when within the same week, I got my blue letter from breast screen, which is the letter that says, come in, you need to have a biopsy. Sharon got made redundant from work and COVID hit. Um, so the three things kind of worked in a way that Sharon was allowed to be at home with me because she, she obviously couldn't go into the office. So any appointments that we had, any hospital visits that we had, she could come as far as the door. So when she dropped me off for my surgery at the hospital, she had to say goodbye to me at the door. And for a partner, that's really tough. And everybody that we dealt with was incredibly supportive. The nurses at the hospital recognised how distressed Sharon was. Um, you know, everybody went out of their way to make her feel very comfortable. And I was very lucky to be able to introduce her as my wife. And we, we honestly have not come across any kind of googly eyes or any kind of difficulty with anyone that we've dealt with, from my surgeon to the chemotherapy team to the radiotherapy team. Everybody has embraced us as a married couple. So we're very fortunate. And, and Michelle, you, you're on the central coast of New South Wales, but you chose not to go in uh, to Sydney. You felt perfectly accepted as a married lesbian couple uh, where you were. And I think we tremendously um, appreciate, particularly of your surgeon. Absolutely. My surgeon is a wonderful, wonderful man. He also works out of the Chris O'Brien Life Centre in Sydney. But he, I met him the day I went in for my biopsy. He was there actually advising on treatments. And I felt so comfortable with him that I decided to go with him. He is a, um, uh, what's the terminology? Um, uh, he, does, he does all kinds of breast surgery, not just cancer. So I was very fortunate in that I had to have four surgeries on my left breast because we ended up finding that there were three tumours, but we only found them sort of one at a time. Um, and so I ended up with four lots of surgery and then chemotherapy and then radiotherapy every day for six weeks. Um, on, our first, on our first wedding anniversary, Sharon actually shaved my head because I was losing my hair and my scalp was very sore. So... Bless her heart, she shaved my head and cried all the way through it. Michelle, can I ask you this? You know, I, I'm very aware that I think you two have been together for 27 years. You're married, mm -hmm. I think, in a few days you're heading off to Paris for your honeymoon yes. and to Switzerland. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're confident and um, mm -hmm. open and you said to me that you were just yourselves when yes. you were with yes. all the different health services. Do you think it could be different? Uh, uh, different for younger people earlier on in their life, perhaps still sorting themselves out in terms of their sexual identity or relationships with their family? Just your reflections on that. Absolutely, Julie. I think anybody that is choosing to come out and is faced then with a diagnosis of breast cancer as well is facing an incredible number of hurdles. Mm -hmm. No one knows until you actually say the words how the person you're talking to is going to respond to the fact that you have decided to announce that you're a lesbian. Um, parents, siblings, family, best friends all react differently and you can't always second guess how they're going to react. So there is a lot of concern for young people actually trying to deal with all of that and then to be told that they possibly are not well with, with breast cancer. It's, it's an awful hurdle to, to have to face. And we're very lucky in 2023 that we have so many support services out there. Can I ask you, Sharon, for your perspective as a partner, it was obviously during COVID, you know, mm. I was going to ask whether you were offered support, but I guess gathering together at that time was very difficult. Well, look, it, it was. It was, um, as Michelle explained, you know, the first, first interaction of dropping Michelle to surgery was um, at Gosford Hospital and, 
you know, the hazmat suits were starting and it was all very early days and, you, you know, before they even hit you with the temperature machine, you know, it was stand back there and I'm, I felt like I was dropping Michelle off like one of our puppies at the vet. It was quite horrendous. I, and the nurses were just amazing. I, you know, I'm saying goodbye to my wife and um, we, were, we, we front as a, as a married couple. We, we are ourselves and they were... They were amazing. They, they were blessed and they were the, the nurses at Gosford Private were were very kind enough to say, Oh, look, just go go to the shops and have a cup of coffee. And I'm saying, Well, and then the clicks, God, you can't do that, you know. Just go home, just go and rest. I mean, the, the support that I had was ultimately my friends. Um, but every interaction was, you know, because realistically we couldn't go anywhere. Um, the support groups and the booklets that we were given you know, were unable to actually meet anywhere and I guess the, the biggest scale of COVID sort of overtook any possible gathering. Um, but every interaction, whether it be with the, you know, the, I was able to go to every appointment with Michelle, um, asked all the questions, you know, quite comfortably. Um, as a team, we were able to, we, we were very well accepted. It was an absolute, um, and I hate to say it, but it, it was a under the worst possible circumstances of the you know, possibly losing the person that you love the most in the whole world, we, we really did have a bit of a fairy tale journey. Look, that is just so good to hear. And uh, I'd love you to listen in as we have further discussions and I will uh, come back to you later for your reflections. Mm. Thank you to Sorry. Michelle and Sharon uh, on the Central Coast. Um, listen, it's time to welcome uh, Jane Usher and we will be coming to a poll shortly, but let's hear from Jane and a reminder that Professor Jane Usher is from Western Sydney University and uh, has been involved in research into the Out With Cancer study. Jane, uh, welcome to the program. It's lovely to have you here. We've heard a diversity there, haven't we? Just your initial reflections. Are these the sort of diversity of views that you got during your study? They are, and I think it's it's great to hear of the positive experiences um, that that some people have had, but also I think the the potential anxiety around disclosure um, and acknowledgement that for other LGBTQI people it can be quite different, and it, it there can be some very negative experiences. Unfortunately, it's good to hear that the people here tonight haven't had those experiences. Could you uh, tell us just a little bit about your research and how it came about and what you were looking at? Well, there's there's growing acknowledgement that LGBTQI people are invisible in cancer research and cancer care, and there have been a lot of calls for uh, increasing attention to, to our population. And But until recently, there's been very little research in this area, and it's mostly been very small scale or had a very narrow focus. And the Out With Cancer study, which is actually the biggest study internationally to date on LGBTQI people with cancer, what we did is we looked across gender. So we had men and women, trans and gender diverse people, people with intersex variations. We looked across cancer types, although I have to say breast cancer was our biggest participant group. And we also looked across ages because most previous research had only focused on older people. So we had 650 um, LGBTQI people with cancer and their carers. And we also looked at healthcare professional experiences and we did an audit of all the online cancer information resources in Australia and also all the LGBTQI resources that exist internationally. And I think what's really important about this research, it was funded by the government, by the Australian Research Council. So that's showing that the government's actually recognising um, that this is important or the ALC were. And it was also co-designed with LGBTQI people with cancer and cancer organisations. So Cancer Council New South Wales, Prostate Cancer Foundation, Canteen and BCNA are partners. And also LGBTQI organisations, so ACON and the LGBTQI Health Alliance. So we're a really strong team of researchers, but also in strong partnership with communities. Uh, you, you may be aware that this Q&A topic has generated a lot of discussion online uh, for breast cancer trials, uh, and, uh, and it, it, a lot of it went to how and whether cancer experiences differ in the LGBTQI community compared to heterosexual, which is sometimes called cisgender. Uh, you know, is there a difference in experience? You know, surely uh, there would be that it would be generally in common and that everybody experiences distress. Can you give us a sense of what your research indicates on that? Because some people did seem to be quite concerned that even challenging the idea that this forum should even be on, as it, uh, that it didn't need to be an independent forum. 
Well, that, that's a, a comment we had on some of our social media when we were recruiting for the study. So I think I, I, I could talk I could talk for two hours about this, but I know I've only got about five minutes. I mean, I think as, as Elizabeth's already said, LGBTQI people have higher rates of cancer to do with lifestyle factors such as smoking and alcohol use and lower rates of pregnancy in, in women and also lower rates of screening, cancer screening. So it's a high risk group in terms of having cancer. We also know that LGBTQI people report higher, significantly higher rates of distress when they have cancer. So in our study, we found that 40% of our participants reported high or very high distress. And that compares with about 7 to 10% in the general cancer population. So this is a really vulnerable population psychologically. And it's also a group who actually have quite high rates of dissatisfaction with cancer care, which has implications in terms of how we deal with cancer treatment, how we whether we go to doctor's appointments and how we feel when we're, we're at the doctor's. And that's partly due to dis experiences of discrimination from healthcare professionals or other people in life in general. And we've already heard about that from Jude today. Or fear of discrimination in healthcare professionals. And I have to say in our study, we did have a lot of accounts of hostility on the part, part of homophobic or transphobic clinicians, I'm very depressed to say. Could I ask you, Jane, was it higher with trans people, gender diverse people, such as, you know, a, 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 man, a man, a person born as a man who's transitioning to a woman? Was that, were there higher rates of distress there or was it across the board? Well, the trans people reported higher distress, also younger people, and actually people who live in rural areas. Um, and I think Catherine's experience of a positive um, rural experience of having cancer is not the same as a lot of other people who are quite afraid of coming out, um, afraid of discrimination in a rural area. Um, so it, it wasn't equal across the board. Um, it's interesting that older cisgender women with lesbian women with breast cancer um, Many did report distress, but it was the group that probably reported lower distress than those younger people. Look, I, um, my instinct, and again, this is just my instinct, I, I defer to you as a professional researcher, but that a mature married lesbian is a less threatening character than a, a younger um, um, gay, uh, lesbian woman or indeed a transgender or, or gender diverse, which is really an expression where people are, often it can mean people aren't sure on seeing someone uh, you know, how to receive their gender, if I could put it that way. So do you think that uh, we need to be mindful that, that the young and the transgender and gender diverse may be in that higher distress group and that need to be directly targeted in our information and services to reassure? Sorry, apologies for my dog. Um, yes, and I think as, a, as an older lesbian couple... If you're confident in terms of dealing with health, talking to healthcare professionals, if you're comfortable coming out, that actually makes your cancer journey much easier. Um, I know when I go to healthcare um, consultations with my own wife, I'm actually confident about that. I expect to be treated positively. And generally, that's my experience. But if you're a younger person, if you're not in a relationship, you're not so confident, that's actually much more difficult. And not having a partner beside you. And another factor that we know is a difference is that many LGBTQI people say they feel really invisible in terms of cancer care, that there's no specific LGBTQI information out there until quite recently. And part of our study has been to actually work with the cancer organisations to produce that information. I, I might just show, Jane, because I think your research group uh, played a major role in the production of this booklet I'm holding up now, which is uh, put out by Cancer Council New South Wales, now distributed nationally. I'm not sure if it's in New Zealand, uh, but uh, if you ring 13 11 20, the Cancer Council Information and Support Line, you can be sent copies and it is online. It's called LGBTQI People and Cancer, and it's full of information, but this is brand new. It's only been out uh, really about a couple of months, I think. Uh, and I guess thank you to you, Jane, and your team for being so involved in that. I, I might introduce our next guest, Jane, and, and, we'll, and we'll come back to you. But if I could welcome Kim Hobbs, uh, uh, the social worker, very experienced social worker from Westmead Hospital. Um, your reflections, if I may, Kim, on, on what you've heard so far and, and the key messages you'd like to get across to, to our audience of people who've had breast cancer, family and friends, and some professionals who may watch this as well. Welcome. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's um, it's wonderful. Um, 
I think it's interesting for the audience to note that none of this is planned. So what everyone has said, they've said individually, but uh, but what I've heard today validates what my experience is um, as, as an oncology social worker. My starting point is that the diagnosis of cancer is a life crisis for everyone. I've not yet met the patient who was happy to hear that they had cancer. So that's my starting point. And to pick up on Jane's point of invisibility, in fact, our sexual sexuality and gender identity is invisible. So the things that are visible are skin colour and age, but even gender isn't really uh, a telltale sign of who you are. So what I want to do is to have a conversation. So everyone who's referred to me and who, with whom I sit in a clinic room, it's a conversation with them to find out who they are, who the people are that support them, and to make no assumptions and no judgments about that, but also to know what about what else is going on in their lives. Because knowing that someone is in a, a same-sex relationship is useful to know, but I, I need to know as well whether that's a supportive relationship and how that's viewed within their community and within their family. What I would hope, and I think we've heard that a little bit from people who were um, who've been diagnosed more recently, is that health professionals, as an intelligent and informed group, by and large, uh, should be quite accepting of uh, of same sex attracted uh, people, and marriage equality certainly did a lot to help that. Where I think the big problems are are, are people who are gender fluid, uh, transgender, and and diverse. So a man who has transitioned, born female, now male, it must be the most confronting thing to find that you have breast cancer. Can I say, I was so interested in the lower rates of screening. And again, I think of the trans people who I happen to have met through my Uniting Church. And these people do not present as women. There's no way if you didn't know. I've watched the change over a number of years. I've been going to this church for about 15 years. But you would never know that they weren't men. And yet I know that they, I'm pretty sure they have breasts. And so what we've heard earlier, and we'll be coming back to our medical oncologist shortly, is that with the hormone therapy, there could be increased risk. So to turn up, to sit in that waiting room at breast screen with a beard would be a bit challenging, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, let's not forget that more than 200 men born male, living life as male in Australia every year are diagnosed with breast cancer. So some of them will be um, will be diverse. And so that's very confronting. And it, it depends on where you are in your, um, your journey and relationship history, uh, how that impacts on the diagnosis of cancer. And that's true for everyone. So I, I don't make any assumptions about everyone. I'm hoping that I treat people differently and that I approach uh, my assessment and history taking with curiosity. So I, I want to know, I want you to tell me what this means for you, how this is impacting you, what else is happening in your life uh, because you are more than um, a lesbian woman or a transgender person. So, and Kim, you've obviously seen hundreds of people in your career, but I understand that you feel uh, you're on a learning curve too when it comes to trans and non-binary people. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that, your learning curve as, a, as an experienced oncology social worker? So um, I am not as um, confident in my understanding of the issues for a transgender person or for a gender fluid person or um, a non-binary person as I am very comfortable with, uh, with same-sex attracted people. And that should not be an obstacle to, to the support and the understanding that I give them because I'm not an expert in that, but the person that I am speaking with, having a conversation with, is the expert. And so they're teaching me. And together we can work out what the issues might be and how we might be able to address those. I have some more issues I'd like to ask you about later, but just now we're, we're going to go to a poll in a moment uh, with our audience. And I wonder if I could just get your thoughts on whether or not it can make a difference uh, to a cancer patient's well-being uh, and overall treatment experience if they 
come out about their gender identity or about their uh, same-sex partnership or whatever. What's your thoughts on, on coming out, being open uh, with the team? I think that uh, that where you have a level of comfort to do that and where you have the support and understanding of your health professionals, um, of course, that increases the trust in that relationship. You're not going to be able to do that until you've you've built some rapport and, and feel some trust with the health professionals that you're talking with. And if you sense that they, there's not acceptance there, then that's a real barrier for you. Uh, so what I would hope is that um, most of the people with whom you deal are able to to be non non judgmental and and to be open and inclusive uh, and and learn with you about what matters to you. Um, so yes, of course, it's better to be open and honest, and that's you know a better relationship that you have, uh, and you will probably have a, a better experience of your cancer. Um, treatment. Uh, but I understand that that's going to be so difficult for some people. Based on what has happened before, you, you may have become estranged from family, friends, colleagues through having disclosed. And so when you're very vulnerable and in need of cancer treatment, then, then there might be a tendency to think, well, I better keep this um, in the closet is a terrible expression, but but you know what I mean. It's uh, I, I really can't afford to put these people offside by uh, and and risk judgment. Um, I, you know, as I listened to you, I remember so vividly my own feelings of vulnerability when I had cancer, and and also that memory that you have so much to do with them during your treatment. But also, I had a five year follow up. The, there were members of my team, particularly the doctors, who were really part of my life for literally five years. So it's it's a major thing. But look, ladies and gentlemen, I, I will be coming uh, uh, to our other panel members about this issue of, of coming out and the value or otherwise of doing it. But it's time for one of our, our polls and we want to pose a question to you uh, for discussion and for answering. Now, if you at home could look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and you remember there are those three little dots, if you hover over these, you can click on the polls heading, and there is a question there which we want people in the LGBTQI plus community with an experience of breast cancer to answer. Did you come out to your doctor and treating team, and was it a positive or negative experience? There are three options. Yes, I came out to my doctor and treating team and it was a positive experience. Yes, I came out to my doctor and treating team, but I had a negative experience. No, I didn't feel comfortable in talking about my sexuality with my doctor and treating team. If you could hover over those three dots and uh, click the poll heading and answer that question, and uh, I'll be coming back to you later with the answers uh, we received. But if I could welcome back Dr. Elizabeth Blackley, our medical oncologist, uh, listening in. Your experience and, and opinion, uh, Elizabeth, on whether uh, it is important to be open as both a patient and a partner about one's uh, gender, about one's uh, non-binary status or about one's same-sex partnership. Your, your thoughts there? Yeah, look, I think it's a really interesting question and I think part of it comes back to how we as medical practitioners actually create an environment for our patients to feel that they can be open. And I think in terms of the medical treatment that you give, I mean, in no way should it be different, but there may be implications on the supportive care in terms of higher rates of isolation, higher rates of depression, um, and higher rates of body dysmorphia depending on um, gender identity. I personally always ask patients very open questions. I don't ever assume. I ask them who's at home or who's in your support team, who's who's in this with you. And um, when people walk into the room with another person, I don't ever assume who that other person is. I think you get caught out doing that once as a very junior trainee and you never do it again if you want to build that rapport with your patients. And as I, as I explained to patients, it's a long-term relationship. They're going to get sick of the side of me. We're going to be spending an awful lot of time together if they're having chemotherapy and they're going to be seeing me for a very long time in terms of follow-up. So that has to be something that's comfortable for them. 
and it has to be something that they feel that they can talk to me and be open and honest with me and I'm pretty blunt in how I deal with people I call a spade a spade and I um, actually, when preparing for this, was talking to a colleague and I said, oh, I don't know how qualified I am. He's like, what do you mean? You look after lots of lesbians. I said, yes, I do, but it makes no difference to me. And really, I think as long as people are supported, I actually had to think, well, do I look after a lot of lesbian patients? And actually I do, but it's just something that personally I don't keep a tally of because I treat people the same regardless. It's about making sure they're cared for, supported, feel comfortable in terms of discussing all of the aspects of their treatment and the support. So look, ultimately I think it is a personal decision on a patient's perspective in terms of how they feel comfortable, but I think it's our job to provide a safe and open dialogue with patients so that there's transparency on both sides of that relationship and we can support people as best as we possibly can. And I think as been, has been mentioned before, we are moving away from a world of oncologists that are mostly men and beyond a certain age. And we have a much more dynamic workforce now with lots of younger men and women that have grown up in a culture where acceptance is the baseline. And yes, there are still cases where that happens and it, it shouldn't happen. Um, but I think we are working towards hopefully a treatment world where, where people can be supported regardless. And could you explain that term body dysmorphia? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, body dysmorphia is basically where people feel the disconnect between their body and how they feel. And it's something very common in the trans community, um, particularly uh, people that are born male or assigned as male. And if they identify as female, obviously there are organs that don't assign to that um, sort of gender identity. And a big part of that is um, sometimes people will actually take hormonal therapy or have gender affirming surgeries. And if you have a trans woman who has taken hormonal therapy for many years and developed breast as part of her gender identity, and you then take away that breast or remove that breast or take away the hormonal therapy that then actually their gender no longer links with what they see in the mirror, that's a really confronting thing. And I mean, even in the cisgender community, if we are taking breasts away from women or to putting women on hormonal therapy, taking away hormonal replacement therapy, the changes in your body that come with that are really very confronting. And I think that's heightened in the trans community and, and in the gender diverse community. And could I ask you, you, you made reference to feeling, you know, with a younger generation more comfortable talking about issues, uh, the, 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 the raising of discussions around sexuality, sexual intimacy, I, I had a different cancer, not breast cancer, but uh, I, um, I was surprised that, uh, to be honest, I've had brilliant care from a multidisciplinary team, but no one has ever asked me, uh, um, is everything going okay with your partner now, Jewel? You know, there's been absolutely no um, uh, probing about, about my psychological well-being, not even depression, but certainly not intimacy. How representative is that? And and I suppose, would there be some clinicians who would feel a bit more nervous around a gender diverse person, a trans person, or even a, a gay man if you're a woman? Do you know what I mean? It, there's a little Absolutely. bit more sensitivity there. Absolutely. But look, I think that's our understanding, our level of comfort with these things. I mean, as I think it's been raised, looking after trans men and trans women and um, homosexual couples, sometimes it is outside my area of comfort, but it's got to, you've got to be open to actually having your patient educate you in terms of what's important. And I think there's a real move in clinicians now that we do ask those questions and we do ask about sexual health and we ask about vaginal symptoms and we ask about intimacy. And I can't always answer the questions that come my way. <laughs> Honestly, I can't, but I actually have a pretty good idea of some resources to send people along to and things that can help. So um, my patients will tell you I ask them all the time and um, it's a very open conversation in my clinic room. And I think being younger and being female, maybe patients feel more comfortable with that, but certainly um, male clinicians, older clinicians definitely don't have 
have that level of comfort. And it, to be honest, it's something that I've had to learn to be comfortable with, but it's no different than us asking our patients, have you opened your bowels today? Are you passing urine okay? There are uncomfortable conversations that you thought you wouldn't have, and you just have to learn how to be comfortable in them because it's a huge part of your patient's journey. Thank you for reminding me that I'm planning to do my bowel screening test tomorrow morning because it's sitting in the bathroom. Look, could I uh, just say uh, well, and welcome to everyone who's joined us to learn all about LGBTQI plus people uh, and breast cancer, and we're really grateful uh, uh, to your interest and, and for your watching this. And uh, I do have uh, the results have just uh, appeared on my screen here in relation uh, to the poll. And the answer to the first poll is that just over 50% of our people watching have said they came out to their treatment team and had a pos positive experience. About 35% have said they didn't feel comfortable talking about their sexuality with their doctor and treating team. Uh, just coming back to you, uh, Elizabeth, uh, our medical oncologist, does that, uh, do those figures sound right to you? Are you surprised by them? Yeah, look, I think it sounds about right. And I think um, the, in this day and age, people, health consumers are actually becoming better at choosing their team and understanding they have a right to choose their team. So I think people also choose practitioners that are more open and they feel more comfortable with. But look, it doesn't surprise me that a large proportion of people don't feel comfortable because go to any public clinic um, in a mass volume centre, you can see a different doctor on any given day. You may or may not have any rapport with that person. And it's a huge thing to talk about someone. There's got to be relationship, rapport, and that sort of level of comfort. So no, it doesn't surprise me. I think we're getting better at it, but we're still not doing a great job. Look, look thank you. And I, I welcome back Professor Jane Usher, our researcher out with Cancer Study. Um, your response to those figures, just over 50% of people have said they came out to their treatment team and had a positive experience, and about 35% have said they didn't feel comfortable talking about their sexuality with their doctor and treating team. How, how does that gel, Jane, with your research on this issue of coming out openly with your team? Well, we found in our study that disclosing identity was actually the, the most difficult aspect of, of cancer care for LGBTQI people. Um, and one participant described it as a, a minefield that she was walking through and that the decision about when to disclose, who to disclose, it was like a really difficult thing that had to be done every day. And I think Catherine talked about it earlier. You meet, you're meeting so many different clinicians. You're having to make the decision every time. And we found that only one in five people in our study, and that's 650 people, actually came out um, to all of their healthcare professionals. So a lot of people were not coming out. Um, and I think, as we, we said earlier, that older lesbian women with breast cancer were more likely to come out than other people, I think, because of comfort. And, you know, as you said yourself, um, maybe the feeling that the clinicians were going to be more receptive. And I think it really is about the clinician's responsibility to create a safe and inclusive environment, um, as Libby has, sa has said, and actually giving signals that it's going to be safe. So wearing rainbow badges, actually asking questions about um, who's your partner, who's the person at home. And actually, again, if, you're, if you've got two women sitting in front of you, not assuming that it's her sister sitting beside her, which is what some of our participants have said. And, you know, some of the younger people find it much harder to disclose and, you know, some, a number of people said to us, I'm really scared that my doctor's going to want me dead if they know I'm gay or if they know I'm trans or they know I'm a lesbian. And that's really, you know, distressing to think that someone can be going through cancer and actually fearing that their clinician might not want them to survive if they find out that they're, they're gay or, or a lesbian. Look, could I come to Catherine Wheeler? Uh, I, I'd just like to come to one of our, 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 our uh, people with experience of uh, breast cancer, and I'm just holding up the, the new Cancer Council booklet, which they've, if you can see, I'm, I'm coming to you, Catherine, because you've got the World Pride flag behind you, and you can see the <laughs> colours are on the front of this, and I know there was a lot of discussion at Cancer Council before they decided to put that there, uh, and I think it was because they wanted to send a positive message in their wall of yellow booklets that have so much information, a sort of welcome message. Your thoughts on how yeah. clinicians can make people feel welcome? Oh, um, and safe. Uh, yes, uh, that safety is so important. Um, and I know um, everyone's coming out experiences are, are so personal and 
um, you know, I'm certainly not one to to say, yes, come out, it'll be easy for you. Of course, you know, I, I would never do anything like that. Um, but I think um, if you walk into a doctor's office and, you know, you see that little symbol there, um, a, a rainbow flag, um, it just does give you that sense of, oh, okay, um, that's good to see and, and that knowing that these people are, are allies and are going to be supportive and not judging, um, then yes, um, that would, I think would, well, it, it probably would have made us feel a bit more comfortable, um, even though we, um, you know, hi, yes, I'm Cathy and here's Linda, here's my, she's my wife. Um, that's how we always introduced ourselves. I think the word wife, um, unfortunately to a degree, I think it has legitimized uh, relationships. So um, to a degree, um, I'm not saying everyone has to get married, uh, but um, when people I think heard the word wife, then there was certainly no ambiguity there about our relationship. So um, that did seem to smooth the path um, to how we were treated. Um, but yeah, anyway, here I go off topic again, but getting back to that, um, uh, yes. Any little sign that you're walking into that treating room and uh, you can see that, um, that yes, that person is going to, be supportive and that you are in a safe place. Uh, being an ally is even or just as important as, you know, being a part of the, um, the gay community. So that allyship is, is very reassuring. Yes, um, I, I have an experience of having gone to high school at an Anglican girls' school. And now during the period of um, uh, the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, the Sydney Anglican school uh, uh they actually fly the rainbow flag over the school playground and have <laughs> written to all parents uh, and and staff to say that uh lgbtqi plus uh girls parents and staff are welcome now that is i think a, mm -hmm. a, a, a an unusually welcoming thing but i mm -hmm. can't tell you as, as an old girl as this is one of those cultures of that school it, it, I, I wept I wept as a mature mm -hmm. woman. I wept, and I'll be coming back to our other, uh, our other people with lived experience as we go on. But I, I'd like to come again to Dr. Elizabeth uh, Blackley because we do have some, uh, some I guess, questions uh, 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 relating to trans people. So let me put them to you, even if there's slight repetition, Libby. If you could turn on your microphone. The first question, a lot of people evidently have asked questions about breast screening for transgender people. Uh, Breda has asked if breast screening is recommended for trans women taking estrogen. So your thoughts on that uh, breast screening issue? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I'll confess I had to brush up on this as well because by the time patients see me, they've normally been through breast screen and had their diagnosis and all of those things. But actually what I did realise when I looked into this was most states' breast screen um, actually has really good information um, for trans um, people and they've actually got pretty clear guidelines on their website. But I think you have to be looking for it to get that information and that's the difficult bit. Um, so certainly... So in most states, you don't recall which don't, do you? No, I don't. I'd have to go and look at all of them. But I know Victoria and New South Wales that I looked at actually had really clear guidelines. Um, and look, what the guidelines suggest is that similar to cisgender women, between the age of 50 and 74, patients that have been on gender-affirming hormones, so trans women on hormones for greater than five years, should have standard screening every two years. Trans men, if they've had chest surgery, then usually don't need to have routine screening or surveillance. But if they have a family history or if there's any concern that maybe they have residual breast tissue, then they should seek 
an opinion. And trans men that have not had um, chest surgery should certainly still have screening as per the national guidelines, um, which is two yearly for low risk people from 50 to 74. Having said that, what a lot of people don't realise is they can actually opt into breast screen from the age of 40 and have funded screening. Again, something that's not particularly well advertised. Um, and the, the other thing I read, which was really um, Real, I mean, not unexpected, but really worrying is that the uptake of screening in the trans community, people that should be having screening, is 50% lower than the people in the cisgender community who are having that screening and being sought out to have that screening. So not only is the, the uptake low, I think unless you actually go looking for the information, the guidelines are not particularly well advertised or clear um, and, and look, maybe the breast surgeons know them but I mean I, I work in breast cancer I, I know the cisgender guidelines off by heart and I actually didn't know that I had to look it, look it up. Look, that's interesting just remind people what cisgender means just in case. <laughs> Question in it's hard now um, so people that uh, identify with the gender that was assigned at birth. That's right. That's just, I just don't like to assume everybody's up with the language. Uh, the second question, Sarah, you, in a way you've, you've gone to, sorry, Elizabeth, you've gone to it a little bit. It's a question from Sarah asking, how can we encourage transgender people to have breast screening and to feel comfortable about doing it? So your thoughts there, what more can be done? Look, I think the big thing is education um, because I think, I mean, as an oncologist that treats breast cancer every day, I actually had to look at those guidelines. So I think the education is probably lacking and education in a forum that actually targets the LGBTQTI community so that it's actually targeted at them and tailored to them rather than just the breast screen flyers you see every now and then. Um, and, and look, I don't have all the answers. I know that um, trans women probably don't automatically receive invitations to breast screen. So I don't know how that's best addressed, but it certainly should be. If you've been on hormones for greater than five years, your risk is not as high as a cisgender woman, but your risk is higher than a cisgender male. So I think um, general practitioners and education with the GPs and primary health providers um, is really important and probably something we don't do well enough and, and breast screen don't do well enough. Look, thank you. I've got quite a few questions to go, so uh, I, I will uh, um, uh, ask us to, to move it a bit, little bit uh, along. If I could come to Kim Hobbs, uh, our social worker from Westmead, who's been listening closely to all of this, um, Many people watching have asked what support services and resources are available for LGBTQI uh, community members. And here are some examples of the sort of questions. Carolyn says that her and her partner found there was little to no mental health support services provided for patients and partners after a diagnosis. I've got a few questions for you, Kim, but what's your response to them on the lack of access to mental health services? Uh, so someone, as someone who works as part of a very well-established psycho-oncology team at Westmead, uh, regrettably, the uh, availability of psychosocial support and psychological support is highly variable across the country. Uh, there are very big differences between the regions and the metropolitan centres. And interestingly, uh, the public-private divide. So you're much more likely to get um, access to uh, psychological support in the public system than in the private. So my advice to everyone, even those who are coming to our centre, is that you need to access uh, the Cancer Council on 13 11 20. Um, Julie's shown you a couple of times uh, that booklet, which is excellent. But there are other support services that they have. So they have the one-to-one um, -one Cancer Connect, one-to-one uh, -one peer support, support that's um, that matches people with a trained volunteer and where possible on cancer type um, age and lifestyle which does include some um, gender diversity so it's worth giving 13 11 20 a ring if you've not been able to to um, access counseling within your center then there are some uh, cancer council uh, professional counselors who are employed by the cancer council there are some costs associated with that, uh, but frequently you can get um, a mental health care plan through your GP. There are other online, sorry. You go. 
other online supports and and one of the good things about COVID, um, I'm not feeling particularly happy about COVID at the moment, but one of the good things that's come from that is the burgeoning of uh, a virtual um, support. And so uh, there is, and you've found the Breast Cancer Trials Group, there's, we've mentioned BCNA uh, and Cancer Council. The caveat for using um, virtual uh, services is that the internet is an unregulated space. And so you need to be accessing uh, sites that are reputable and uh, monitored. Uh, and usually they will be the sites that come out of big um, government or uh, hospital or health service um, uh, organisations. Just to focus a little bit on the question about carers, um, in some other um, research I did with Jane quite a few years ago now, where we looked at cancer support group attendees, uh, what we found to our surprise was that the uh, levels of anxiety depression, and depression were higher in the carers who attended support groups than in the people with cancer who attended, and quality of life was lower. This was a really surprising result. Thank so, you. Could I come in there? Because one of the uh, questions that's come through from someone called Julie goes to the, the great support that she felt she was offered as someone with breast cancer, but the limited or, or lack of support for a female partner, a female support group. Just a brief comment on that, please. Uh, I'm not aware of any um, existing support for female partners of people, someone with breast cancer. What, what you're going to need to do is to find uh, a, a support group that is inclusive of carers, and some of them will be. Uh, I, as a part of my um, research to do this tonight, I looked at Carers Australia. That's a very credible organisation. Interestingly, they have no resources uh, specific to LGBTQI plus people, um, although they would be very supportive of, of contact from, from people uh, who are gender diverse. So there's no, I think we're lagging behind. Uh, the so supports and services that I did find are based in the US. I'm not sure whether there's going to be a mechanism for me to uh, to provide some of that information to Anna uh, that can perhaps be posted later. Uh, but there are some there are better uh, support resources uh, out of the US, and I guess that's about population size, really, rather than. Well, I, I should say that Belinda Rose has also asked how can breast cancer support groups ensure they are inclusive of gender and sexually diverse members. Look, I might ask you, Libby, can I have a quick comment from you as a, a doctor working with patients? You said you have a number of lesbian patients. How, uh, how can those cancer support groups start supporting the partners of lesbian women or, uh, with, uh, with uh, breast cancer? Look, to be honest, I think we're maybe not great at supporting any partners of women going through breast cancer, be they male, female or other. Um, I think it's been a real gap. Um, and particularly even, even supporting patients themselves, like the access, um, as mentioned, to clinical psychology, to social work, it's been somewhere there is a real gap. So, look, I think the more that organisations like BCNA and BCT can actually tailor information, um, the better. So there's more to read. I think online support groups are actually really important and you'll find that most women that we look after or most patients that we look after are in multiple for better or worse, but having good quality support groups for particular um, population groups to be able to go into, be they um, homosexual partners, be they heterosexual partners, but actually maybe having a bit of um, spe specificity to the options that are available there. But I think it's really hard because I actually think we do a bad job across the board of it at the moment, just because of resources. Look, look, thank you so much. Jane Usher, I'll come back to you uh, as our researcher who's been looking at this in such an extensive way. I, I have a couple of questions for you, but any comments on what you've been hearing based on the research that you've done? Well, I, I think I'd really reiterate what Kim said, the importance of um, acknowledging the needs of carers. And we actually found in our research that the carers were as distressed as the patients. So 40% of our carers had high or very high distress and often felt quite excluded. Um, I think I think very different from some of the experiences that we've heard from our um, people online today, but often felt excluded from consultations. 
um, felt it was very difficult. And I think, again, going to the experience of trans carers, often feeling that um, they had to conceal their trans identities when they were caring and changing the way they appeared or actually wanting to appear as if they weren't trans so they wouldn't get discriminate, discriminated against. Um, so I think it's it's really important that we take the, take the carers on board as well as the LGBTQI people with cancer. Just staying with this distress issue, you, you know, your Out With Cancer study did find these higher levels of distress. And, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about those findings and your assessment of why that is an increased level of anxiety and distress. What's the heart of it? Well, we know that there's higher rates of distress in, in the LGBTQI population anyway. So there's higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, not for everybody, um, but it's because of that sort of legacy of discrimination in life. If you've got older people, um, because being a lesbian or being a gay man was something which was not acceptable um, when they were young, often being excluded from family, maybe discrimination at work, um, and, and people being, you know, having harassment on the street, higher levels of violence. So it's not surprising that as a population, there's high levels of distress. And that legacy comes into the experience of cancer and cancer care, people feeling vulnerable, fearing disclosure, as we've already talked about. Um, and people finding that there's cancer can have a negative impact on their gender identity and on their LGBTQI identity. So as we've, we've already heard about in terms of gender dysphoria with trans people, having cancer can actually really impact on how they experience themselves in terms of trans identities. The other side of it is for some people, cancer can be gender affirming. So it, it can actually be a positive experience for, for some trans people, the change that's, that happened in the body. But also many LGBTQI people don't have strong social support. They don't have family support. Um, and many get support from what we call chosen family. So it might be friends or ex-partners. And it's really important that we incorporate chosen family in, in cancer care. But, you know, I think very worryingly, 85% of people in our study reported discrimination in life and 45% said they had discrimination in cancer care. So these are extra levels of stress that are not there in the non-LGBTQI population. And as you know, in, in some of the um, online commentary in anticipation of this forum, as we mentioned earlier, there has been some very strongly worded points of view that everybody feels immense stress. And, uh, uh, you know, is it important to... Uh, even are we saying that this group of people have higher levels of distress? Well, you really are. So what's the sort of education that's required for clinical teams and even for, I don't know, for, for the broader community so that they understand this issue and can approach it perhaps with a more open and empathic heart than we've seen in some of those comments because it did seem to rub some women who've had lived experience of breast cancer right up the wrong way. I think it's important to acknowledge that cancer is really distressing for everybody whether you have a cancer diagnosis or someone really close to you has a cancer diagnosis. And I know that from you know, my own experience of caring for very close family members with cancer. And I think that it, it's distressing for all of us. It, it, it's not taking away from someone's experience to say that there are particular groups, and today we're talking about the LGBTQI population, who have additional stresses to deal with in terms of disclosure, fear of hostility, and other experiences of discrimination in life. And I think it's about having awareness of that as clinicians and as researchers, having compassion about that and making sure that our services are inclusive and are affirming so that we're not making people feel that they can't come for treatment, they can't come for screening, they can't bring their partner into the session with the clinician because of their LGBTQI identity. So I think it's really not taking away from the distress that anybody with breast cancer might have, but saying that this is a group that might have other stresses that are also impacting on them. Look, let's go to our second poll question. We've just got time to do it. And uh, you'll remember that if you go to the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see three dots. If you can hover over there and uh, click on the polls heading, uh, you will see how you can participate in this poll. This question is for people uh, in the LGBTQI plus community with an experience of breast cancer. Did you experience an increased level of distress or anxiety during your breast cancer treatment because you were worried about how you would be treated as a member of the LGBTQI plus community? It, the answer, your alternative answers are yes, 
I had an increased level of distress or anxiety during my best breast cancer treatment because I was worried about how I would be treated as a member of the LGBTQI plus community or no, being a member of the LGBTQI plus community made no difference to my treatment experience. If you could hover over your dots, go to the poll and answer that question. Uh, we'll give you the answer uh, just before we finish our webinar tonight. Uh, Kim Hobbs, if I could just come back to you on these treatment related body image issues about going through breast cancer with a lumpectomy or a mastectomy or changes to hair, for example, which uh, which uh, impact on your body image. Uh, do you think these changes affect uh, this LGBTQI plus community more or is it really uh, something that can be distressing across the board and it would be more an individual response? So again, uh, those sort of body image changes are applicable to all people with cancer. Uh, but if it's complicated by the way in which you uh, have your level of comfort in talking about intimacy and sexual function, then, uh, then that's a, another barrier. And I think we need to be clear that uh, we're talking about both intimacy and sexual function. So in a, another piece of research I did with Jane a, lot, a long time ago, people with cancer and their partners told us that they wanted their health professionals to ask about their sexual function and their intimacy needs. Uh, but they also told us that they weren't asked by, um, by their health professionals. And the health professionals told us that, uh, that they felt uncomfortable um, raising that as an issue. And Libby's told us how she's uh, worked to make sure that, uh, as I have done too, to uh, to inc incorporate that as part of anything you're talking about. You know, if you're a, a breast care nurse, you wouldn't fail to ask someone about how their wound is or their nausea from chemotherapy or their radiotherapy skin changes or their pain or their bowel function. And so you should add to your list of, of things that you talk about and how are things with intimacy and ask those open-ended questions and get to understand what that's about. But there are the subtle changes as well. So if you have persistent nausea, if you came to this experience with anxiety or depression, if you've lost or gained a lot of weight, if you've got an ugly looking scar that, um, that is really confronting for you. If you're menopausal all the time, then uh, there's some conversations to be had about what, what's happening there, as well as looking at what else is happening in your life because cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum. So you're in this uh, same sex relationship, but is it going okay? I don't assume that all of my heterosexual couples have a happy um, relationship, so I, I can't assume that of, of other people. Are there financial issues? Are there employment issues? Are there family difficulties? Have you become estranged or distant from your family because of your, uh, your sexuality? And how does that impact on the way that you experience your intimacy and your relationships. Look, could I get a very brief comment from you, Michelle Stevenson, as someone with lived experience? Have you did you have you had someone talk to you about intimacy, sexuality, psychology? Just very briefly, has that been offered to you? Yes, Julie, it has. Um, it was prompted by us, though. It wasn't offered uh, as just a, a general piece of information. Um, one of the wonderful things about our teamwork is that Sharon tends to ask questions that I don't even think of. So she comes up with all kinds of wonderful questions to ask our, our treating team. And our oncologist was very open and uh, happy to discuss what uh, is available, what we might need to look at, whether we needed any kind of psychological help, whether we needed to um, visit a sex shop, um, you know, whatever we needed. She was quite open to discussing any of that. You've, you've, you've got an example of contemporary clinical care, haven't you, in your story? Mm. Very yeah, briefly, really Jude, I know that there's a little bit of time passed here, but was the issues of sexuality, intimacy, body image raised in your, your situation? Never. Not until 2009 when I came back to Canberra and I got a McGrath nurse um, and she she was more than open. But up until then, I hadn't, well, as the partner, 
Uh, nor Beck either. No one spoke to us about it. It just didn't come across the table. Um, but certainly the McGrath nurse was more than happy to talk about it and, and, and brought it up. And this is the best lubricant and this is the best sex <laughs> place to go to and so on. So she was fantastic. Thank um, you so much. Very lucky to Thank you. We, we, we love that nurse. And Catherine Wheeler in rural <laughs> Queensland, how's it going with intimacy discussions? Yeah, uh, just not happening. <laughs> Nothing. Nada. <laughs> Okay, look, thank you. I just thought we'd get a snapshot there, an unrepresentative, mm. but still a snapshot. We have the results from our last poll. 60% of people said they had an increased level of distress. Uh, uh, they had an increased level of distress and anxiety during breast cancer treatment because they were worried about how they would be treated as a member of the LGBTQI mm. plus community. And 40% said their sexuality made no difference to their treatment experience. So 60 experiencing anxiety, 40% uh, uh, saying no. If I could come to you, Jane Usher, and we're at our final question now, I, I guess... I, I want to ask you about access to clinical trials. Of course, we, we're with breast clinical trials here. Uh, any information uh, in your research around access or barriers to access for the LGBTQI community to this, in critical, this very critical role of access to clinical trials? Well, I think what we see is that there's quite low numbers of LGBTQI people come forward to take part in research in clinical trials. Um, because they either say it's not relevant to me or there's a fear of possible discrimination. But also, LGBTQI people are often invisible. If researchers don't ask about sexual orientation, they don't ask about diverse gender identity, so they just assume everyone's a woman or a man. They don't ask about other identities, trans or non-binary, and they don't ask about intersex status, then you don't know whether, as a researcher, you've got LGBTQI people in your population. So it's absolutely essential that we collect that data when we're doing research. And that then encourages LGBTQI people to take part because they say, oh, this is relevant to me. And it's also so important on clinical intake forms that we collect that data. I don't know if you know, but cancer registries at the moment don't collect data on LGBTQI status. And that is something that's being addressed but we need to be collecting it at the clinical level. And that actually is a way that's going to help clinicians also be more inclusive in their practice. And I think what we found in our research is that when we actively target LGBTQI people by having um, advertising material in studies, having information sheets that specifically mention LGBTQI people as well as other people, then we do get people participating in research. And also having LGBTQI people as part of stakeholder groups, as advisory groups, and having forums like this, which is, a, is, is so important to actually say, we are there, we're visible, and this is a community that whose needs we need to address. You know, based on all you've discovered, if, you, if there were three key reforms you would like to see that could improve uh, cancer care for this community, this diverse community, what, what would be those three things that you'd like to see real action on? Well, I think the first would be to acknowledge the needs of LGBTQI people with cancer, that legacy of distress and their specific needs that we talked about, and to include um, you know, demographic information about gender identity and sexuality and intersex status and all of the registries and intake forms. But I think probably most importantly is the education of healthcare professionals so that LGBTQI training is part of general education and professional development and that's something as a, as a team that we're actually working with um, various organizations to do this and we're also developing practice guidelines and that's something that the clinicians say to us that they want they say a lot of clinicians say look i want to be lgbtqi inclusive but i'm not necessarily comfortable and i think particularly with trans and intersex people we found and I want information, I want training, I want practice guidelines. And I think we've seen that today with, you know, both Kim and Libby saying they don't they they want to do practice in a really inclusive way. And they they actually, you know, they they're having to talk to patients about to be educated by the patients that we should be providing that education for everybody. Look, uh, it has just been the most marvelous discussion tonight. I think many issues raised. Uh, that we very rarely hear. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I, I'd just like to thank Jane, Michelle, Sharon, Jude, Kim, Elizabeth, 
thank Catherine, you know, for your openness, your advice, your guidance, and for, and I also, of course, want to thank everybody who's joined us and, and, and asked questions. Would you just do some deaf sign clapping, team, just to clap each other and to reaffirm, uh, you know, gratitude to everyone. But, uh, very uh, grateful uh, to Kim for coming when you're um, active with COVID and uh, and our doctor, Dr. Blackley, our medical oncologist, a special thank you to you because I know you were seeing a patient, I think, seven minutes prior to joining us on screen. We do want to reiterate that support services are available and there are excellent resources available. Cancer Council Australia and in all the different states, Breast Cancer Network Australia, both their websites this booklet, you can ring 13 11 20, uh, mentioned by Kim Hobbs, our social worker, 13 11 20. That's a free national line across Australia. I'm sorry to our New Zealand viewers. Uh, I know you have a number there as well. And they can connect you. Uh, they have uh, clinically trained people on those phones who can connect you to services. This Q&A will be available on the Breast Cancer Trials website tomorrow. And the team will be sending everyone who's registered uh, for this webcast uh, a direct link uh, to be able to view it. And uh, we also, as you'd be aware, do look to the community for support uh, for this all important research uh, and particularly clinical trials uh, that are, we've been talking about tonight. So if you or your family or friends would like to make a donation, uh, the website is www.breastcancertrials.org. .au. I'm Julie McCrossan. It's been an absolute pleasure to be your host this evening. And thank you very much and goodbye to all. Thank you.